thank you for your attention so far. And we're back to the hardware track with now a panel with our generous contributors to this track. Um, so we have Ben Gardner from Yellow Flag Security, uh, a heavy vehicle hacker, he said, say truck hacker. So I'll say a truck hacker. Um, we also have Eric Evanchik. Um, you, if you were in the Katak Pro talk earlier, well, you know, he's also a car hacker. And we also have Marc-André Lamonté, which, much like me, is not much of a car person. We're more of a IoT privacy people. Also, it works at Desjardins and is very interested in anything that has to do with intrusion testing. Uh, I'll keep those presentations short. If there's anything you'd like to say about yourself before we start, go right ahead. Um, any anecdotes between all of you? Who's a fan of whom? No, I, we're not going to do a reality show type, <laughs> but I'm fairly sure we have a few uh, Cantac Pro supporters in, in the, the chat. So. Um, before we start, the way this works for those who are at their first Q&A, um, you can go into Slido, ask your questions, and I'll moderate them. You can vote for questions you're curious about, and maybe I'll listen to the popular vote. Maybe I'll be a dictator. Who knows? you got to participate to find out. Okay. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask to everyone is, so oh, one notable exception about... Uh, most of you are not came, didn't come from hardware. Uh, you came from curiosity, came from tinkering. Uh, very interested in the whole picture of systems, probably. But how do you go from that to tinkering with Arduino, maybe, or you know, tell me where you started uh, to working on the real hardware stuff? So you could all jump in at the same time. It's going to be chaos. No. <laughs> chaos <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> It's like there is no difference between like uh, small hardware and big hardware. It's like you just pick it, pick it, and look at it. It means if it speak to a network, then it is real hardware and deserve uh, investigation. As long as it is connected, gathering data, sending data, I do pick it. <laughs> yeah, I think my recommendation there would be just to build something, anything like especially like stuff so accessible nowadays with development boards or even the badge that you already have that you can write code for, um, just to start playing with that and you know seeing how it works and oh, how do I get data out of this? Or, hey, it's got an accelerometer. How do I read the data in from that? Because I think that's just how you'll learn how a lot of those interfaces work. Is And once you learn one is, hey, the accelerometer is I squared C, now you, you know about I squared C and you'll run across a lot of other I squared C stuff. But also once you get to look at SPY or CAN or whatever other hardware interface, it'll have similar concepts. And so once you start looking at that, it's it becomes easier and easier uh, after you do the first one. Yep, no dissenting opinion here. Same thing, you know, hardware is hardware, especially if you're trying to break something, get some tools, crack something open, have a look, um, definitely universal protocols. Get a logic analyzer. Once you have a logic analyzer and you find those traces, you're going to find lots of interesting data and learn about I2C, learn about SPI. Probably. It's not different. You could just go do it. That's a good tangent. What would be, you, you say, like the top three things that somebody should have in their I am just getting started kit? There's a really good spreadsheet by yeah. uh, Dmitry Minaspazov that, that I linked. And like it's, it's already sorted by things that are tiers for what your budget is and rather than like retread that i'm going to say just go to that that spreadsheet the, the only one i'll say you probably absolutely need is a multimeter um because it, it's it's just like the on the most base tool of, of electrical engineering and i'd also say don't cheap out on like spend a little extra on if you want to use the thing because the cheap ones are real cheap you can get you know for 50 or 80 bucks you can get like an okay one um, you don't have to go with the fancy fluke models, but I, yeah, I'd invest a bit in that if you want to get into it, just because uh, it's such a ubiquitous tool. Yeah, I agree. Multimeter is the very first tool that I've got. So for people who have zero access to tools and you know don't want to put pressure on the global uh, shipping system at the moment, uh, some people might be looking into getting some time at their local hackerspace 
if your local lacquer space allows this right now. So Takamaga Ara, sorry I butchered your Nick. Um, ask how much does your local hacker space help you in doing hardware hacking? It could be as you yeah. were started. <laughs> I, I know I am actually <laughs> so um yeah I'm part of uh, a local hacker space the same and uh, it's like we have we do have a electronic workbench uh, so we brought tools there and uh, yeah hopefully the pandemic went up and so we'll be able to uh, get there again uh, so it, it helps like i know they do uh, also do the same for cars so it's like a co-op garage when you can rent time and work on your car in a community uh, sort of place so it much it is much less expensive for everybody involved so the black the hacker space definitely helps in that yeah, there's a group called Open Garages that aims to do that sort of hacker spaces for cars, I guess. The, the only one I've been to is in Seattle, but it's quite a nice little garage they have there where you can people can bring in cars and work on them and they have all the tools. No hacker space here, sorry, but I'm jealous of those those sound great. <laughs> well, next time we're in person, I can give you a tour. Um, awesome. So one that's a voted at the moment, so I'll go with a voted no, no, going to have my own proclivities going on top of this. Any badge idea that's not been done that you'd love to see done? <laughs> ben has an oh. idea. I don't know what it is. But... He doesn't Actually, want to say no, I'm struggling. I think it's all been done. I mean, that's a rough thing to say, but. Hmm. I feel like at this point the badges are basically art, and so it's like, yeah, what what art hasn't been done? I don't know, right? You can keep, you can do it in any other different ways. This is I put this on because it's my favorite badge. It's the uh, QueerCon 2016 badge, uh, and I just think it's real pretty. <laughs> it does some cool stuff, but it's also just nice and pretty. That's a really good way to put it. They're art, so do more art, please, because I want to own it. <laughs> any any favorite badges on your end? The brain one. Yeah, the brain is right uh, up there. For sure. that's, and that's you know this? The battery uh, is on the reverse side in my case. Usually the battery will be on yep. this side. But uh, I moved up the battery because I needed to access uh, the uh, SPI Nord flash. So to clip on it. Uh, to reverse the, the battery. Speaking of badges, so someone asks, I got a badge this year. Good job. If you want a badge, Nordsec has a shop. Shop Nordsec.io. Sorry, I'm done with the S. Um, so I got a badge this year. No idea what to do. Where should I start? And so expert advice on where should I start. No, no hints if you have some insider information. We're very uh, serious about the non-CTF badge. <laughs> uh, I'll say I made a workshop and the, the code actually were on this badge, the NordSec 2021 badge. And I had no clue. Well, at the time when I chose the MCU, the microcontroller, uh, I didn't know that NordSec badge team will chose, choose the same one. So I knew just a few days ago that uh, these are the same chip. I was lucky. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do the YouTuber thing right now. Okay. <laughs> so where would you, and I'll expand this question, you know, any piece of hardware, what's your method when you say like, okay, I want, I want to figure out this thing. What do I do? Do you JTAG first? What would you do? Sort of block diagram, you know? start drawing what you see and you can figure out how it connects by looking at the traces or by using the multimeter that both of these smart gentlemen said you should own. And uh, once you connect it with the labels, yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> Do that block diagram so you get a picture. Of like Ali, you said, read the labels. What, what do yeah, you do yeah. when you have like mystery chip? Like this one is pretty good. You know what it is, but most of the time when you look at consumer electronics, it's been blast it out into oblivion, send it out. 
Yeah, okay. um, I have uh, this particular problem. So I'm still uh, looking for a proper method. So um, I'm having a microcontroller that I want to study. Uh, it's from Qualcomm and it's uh, linked to uh, um, like a 4G uh, cell modem. And uh, it seems to be under some sort of non-disclosure agreement. So I can't find documentation. So uh, this nut is much harder to crack. Yeah, there's. Yeah, you, you don't always hit gold where you can look at the FCC database and just wig it. <laughs> it can be really hard without without data sheets, right? Because you you have to guess what some pins are, and often then you're looking at other chips and trying to figure out well, you know, what could these do, and based on where they connect, what it would be. Um, also, sometimes there's search engines uh, that are not Google and that focus mostly on other countries that tend to have data sheets that maybe aren't supposed to be public. <laughs> um, so yeah, use your use all the search engines at your disposal. Uh, sometimes you luck out and you know Baidu has something that Google doesn't. <laughs> nice. I mean, my I <laughs> Did you try Yandex? Yandex might yeah, they, you can have some luck with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the the NDA parts are an interesting one. Even when you're doing this work, you know, professionally for uh, companies that make devices using these chips, it can be a challenge because they don't necessarily have the permission to give you the access to that uh, data sheet. So sometimes you have to go through these sort of multi-party agreement things and then you don't want to sign away too much of your right to do security research on it either. So it, it becomes a bit of a balancing act uh, that can be tough. The good news is that it, you know, a lot of stuff, at the end of the day, those, those people who make the chips want to sell chips and they sell less of them if there's NDAs involved because it's just a longer process. So there's, there seems to still be a the majority of stuff will have available documentation. Yeah, that's what I noticed. It's like uh, it's just a minority of chip, but yeah, cellular modem are still interesting. One, yeah, there's one I had to look at a while back that was a it was specifically a chip that goes in the key fob remote for cars uh, that allows you to unlock the car and start the car. And yes, that was under an, and you were not getting that data sheet. <laughs> so yeah, that's the type of thing where good luck. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to uh, try to figure it out because they aren't giving it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. I'm curious how you balance this out in, uh, because I learned something in uh, Cory Doctorow's uh, keynote about how car manufacturers had shifted the goalposts by saying, well, fine, we're going, you, you want to regulate what's going on the wire and make it a bit more accessible, we'll just shift to a wireless network. Like how do you how do you balance your research and then you'll stumble upon these things and you have to contextualize them in a security assessment, but but like what do you do when you find things that just look plain I, I'll say like plain off, like or you know, forgotten interfaces or that happens, interfaces that that happens a lot. Um, I think it's maybe people are getting better and testing more of this, but you know, in automotive, you used to find stuff enabled that wouldn't, is not supposed to be enabled in production just all the time. Uh, there's been vulnerabilities on on vehicles due to that, like over and over and over. And it's actually a really hard problem uh, in you know in that product life cycle because you have to, you know, you're designing something and you need debug access to design it. And then at some point you got to turn off certain functionalities and ideally you're also verifying that they're turned off, but then you also have to manage that whole process and make sure that, you know, you actually have this production versus debug firmware and the right one is getting loaded and preferably the, only the right one could ever be loaded using things like secure boot. But it's, uh, you know, it's not, Unfortunately, it's not that simple to do all those pieces right. So, yeah, that stuff does slip by. And I mean, in security testing, you find them and you report them. And sometimes they go, oh, well, we know that's there and we're not worried about it. Um, and then you maybe try to exploit it uh, in a way that shows that it really shouldn't be there. Or in other cases, uh, you know, I've had some where we just sent one can frame, something happened that definitely shouldn't have. We showed that to the client and they went, oh, no, we've got to fix that. So it really depends. I have a, a 
this one, I'm sure you've heard that question before, but what's the one book you'd recommend about like uh, hardware? I was going to say electronics. Let's just have hardware as a whole. That one's pretty easy. It's uh, Hacking the Xbox by Bunny Blank. Gotta read that. Yeah. And then just learn off the uh, the internet basically. I don't remember one specific book, but uh, it's like uh, Stack Overflow, uh, blogs, uh, specification from manufacturer. Uh, it's like anything, but I don't, I actually didn't read a single book that I can remember, only websites. I'm just yeah. kind of hoping that Eric's going to pull up the electronics, but I don't know if that's the one because that would be mine. Uh, I mean, in terms of books, yeah, <laughs> the art of electronics is sort of the often called the best book about electronics, and I I would agree with that assessment, having read most of it but not all of it. Um, it's it's a very good introduction, but it is an introduction to things that people doing security might not be as interested in, right? Like it, it's a lot of the theory of you know, how transistors work and how you use them and Think, things of that nature that are not necessarily going to be how you get a shell on an embedded Linux system or something, right? That's that's way far down. But if you're looking for the low level stuff, that's great. And then, uh, as Malcolm Andre said, the uh, you know the internet's a great resource for those technical things as well. Uh, hacking the Xbox is an excellent introduction to like what is hardware hacking. It was the first book I read about it. It's great. Another one from Bunny. Uh, Bunny Huang is, whoa, my camera hates this. The the Hardware Hacker, which oh, yeah. is published by No Starch, which is just a bunch of his blog posts, and it's just a bunch of cool stuff. Oh. And then, I do remember, oh, sorry. The, I do remember. Yeah, the employer doesn't like that either, but there's also uh, the Car Hacker's Handbook, which is in Cars, which is available for free as an ebook online if you Google it. Uh, okay. I'd recommend that one just if you're into cars. I would recommend Proof of Concept or Get the Fuck Out Bible. <laughs> Big collection of articles. <laughs> oh, and if you dig books, those books are so, like, freaking satisfying in every... Like, you, the thing I like about people who do hardware is the same thing I like about these books. is It shows that somebody cared. And with hardware, you immediately know, like, did this person care when they designed this? Or did they give absolutely zero anyway uh, <laughs> another another question and so that kind of ties into that so creating a new piece of technology and you know this is going to eric but it's going to all of you because with what you've shown us with that proof concept macron i think it also ties into it uh, so creating something that's useful can sometimes feel like super overwhelming um uh, how do you get started on like fixing problems with hardware or Finding cool stuff with hardware it doesn't need to be like saving society, but it could be like exploring the world around you or. Yeah, I'll say pandemic helps. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're not yeah. going here. We're not stuck in our labs. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think in some cases, there's a lot to be said about making something that's just like incrementally better than something else that maybe has been done. Um, I know like Joe Fitzpatrick came out with a tiger type, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. It's his like, you know, USB to uh, serial device and it supports a bunch of different serial interfaces. <laughs> and you know, that's been done to death. You can buy those from Adafruit or DigiQ or wherever and there's a bunch of them out there. But like he specifically wanted one that was USB-C and in a certain form factor and all of this. And you know, it was documented well and so on and so forth. And so sometimes it's not about, you know, some breakthrough, like, hey, this is some brand new technology. And to be frank, the CanTAC thing isn't, there's a ton of CAN bus tools out there. Um, it's sometimes just about, hey, like, let's take this and put it in a specific package or specific pinouts or whatever. The the clones of CanTAC that a lot of people have used and found useful. I know like uh, you know, there are a few large tech companies that are using one of the clones of it. Uh, for doing testing of like rather large systems, believe it or not. Uh, and they just chose one because the guy who designed it, I, I, he was originally trying to build something for uh, hydroponics and aquaponics setups. And so his design used screw terminals where you put a, uh, just a bare wire in and screw it down. And they wanted that instead of the connector. So they bought his, right? So sometimes it's just this like, 
you know, little changes that make it more like better for a specific purpose is more important than, hey, I'm gonna design something totally new. Um, because it is hard to find something that's totally new and undone that's going to change the world or whatever. Uh, incremental improvements are often the way to go. I, I'm curious, what's your like most satisfying project that each of one, like the, the one thing that you built, it doesn't need to be, like we, we said earlier, it can be art, right? What's the thing you built that you were like, nailed it? Yeah. It's uh, when I was like uh, 16 years old, so back in the day, I built, uh, was always running out of battery. So I've built myself a power supply that will uh, bring 120 volt alternative to 12 volt and variable voltage uh, DC. That is uh, the hardest thing. <laughs> it's like that took the longest. And uh, back in that time, uh, I didn't have the internet. So I had like the municipal uh, library. So I got to go there back and forth uh, to, to know how to do it. So it took forever, but that was the most satisfying one, the power supply. <laughs> that, that's nice. I'm going to need to talk to you because I, I know a lot of people who do like in, you know, voting or they'll do say, like for self-sufficiency. But they buy kits that are pre-made and they don't know the math behind it. And I'm thinking for a 10 year old, that was like a lot of math to figure out. So Yeah, but uh, it's like we learn like the whole thing. And I had a friend and we make contests like the one who can produce like the most electrical current at 12 volts. Wow. And we had like a big electromagnet and it, uh, it, it has to be able to lift weight. So... That's how we tested the hard things. That is super cool. I'm thinking there's, you know, very patient parents and very, um, you know, on oh, the weird list science teachers involved in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ben, what would be yours? Uh, you know, I like kind of the ugly stuff. This uh, past summer, I managed to transmit some signals to a heavy vehicle just with uh, one flying lead and a capacitor and a bunch of bit banging. To me, that was just awesome. I don't know. I like just goofy hacks like that. And the fact that it worked really satisfying. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I like it. Minimalist, pretty excellent. Yep. Eric. Will be yeah, this one is, I think, one of my favorite, like, ugly hacks. Uh, I don't know. It's just a fun story. So years back, I was working on a prototype vehicle. It was based on some GM stuff that they had given us. And we had what's called a brake booster. So this was an electric vehicle. We had this thing called a brake booster that it's basically a vacuum pump. Because normally the engine in your car acts as a vacuum pump, has a vacuum pump in it. The uh, Your brakes use that to do power brakes. This We didn't have that in the engine. There was no engine. So you know, we needed a brake booster, which is an pump, electric pump. Problem is that the GM brake booster that we had from them was designed for different cars that had an engine. It was only designed to provide a bit of vacuum, only sometimes. So we had to figure out what messages that we could send it to make it be on all the time. <laughs> And through a bunch of kind of reverse engineering of how the thing, well, what signals it was listening to, to determine what was going on, we were actually able to convince it the engine was turning on and off every 10 seconds, which would keep it on at all times. And uh, that actually somehow worked. <laughs> so we turned this <laughs> into a, one that ran the higher duty cycle. Uh, and yeah, that was, that was a dumb hack <laughs> that somehow worked out. But, uh, you know, just making do with the parts that we had. Yeah, that's operating outside of specification, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I would say <laughs> I, 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 I was on the public roads. It was for, uh, it was on test track and all that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting one. Definitely not as engineered. <laughs> Speaking of engineering, I have a question on security tooling. And so this, I believe, Inches on Eric's presentation about Rust tooling, but I want you all to chime in. Um, do you think, like, within there's Rust, there's Go, there's Python, um, which do you think has the most, like, the, the brightest future ahead of it in the embedded tooling world? And is one of these confined to the embedded tooling world? It's like I use Python and C mostly. 
and even uh, like uh, assembly language. Yeah, I think Rust has some interesting, it's very new, but it has some interesting things that could come out of it. <laughs> um, so first off, there is stuff like you know, what I ended up being able to do with the cross-platform compatibility. Like that is something that's very hard to do with C, just mostly for legacy reasons and that Rust is addressed pretty well. So that's awesome. There's also quite a bit of effort going into making Rust run on microcontrollers, um, which actually does work nowadays. So that's really neat because uh, I actually had a talk back at uh, Black Hat in 2019, I think, about writing applications in Rust for ARM Trust Zone. And that's a case where you, know, you have this potentially very security sensitive application you want to make sure it's got memory safety, and that's something Rust can more or less guarantee for you as long as you don't use the unsafe keyword. Um, and because of that, it, it is very interesting for those types of applications. So it may actually target some embedded stuff. And then there's also some tooling around it. Uh, most recently, uh, I think it's probe.rs, which is actually an implementation for debug tool or tool. So it runs on your PC and connects to JTAG or SWD. Uh, for debugging. So there's a lot of interesting tooling coming up in that, but I think, you know, they all have their place. Like Python is great for writing scripts where you want to really quickly iterate and really quickly build something out. Uh, Rust is an interesting language for building more of the you know, heavyweight uh, software, you know, stuff that needs to last longer, live longer, to be frank. Um, and obviously C is never going to go away. <laughs> That's just how most will write embedded software. <laughs> I think everything you're saying, Eric, and plus there's some cool work going into bringing Rust written drivers into the Linux kernel that have a pretty big impact on the higher end embedded systems that also aren't going to go away as things get, get centralized. So definitely Rust for securing your things and Python for breaking your things. <laughs> a quick closing question. Uh, I'm sure your talks today and your workshops have inspired people. Who inspires you the most in the hardware world at the moment? Uh, a, I mean, I, I think go first. I think my, my friend uh, Rare, he, he inspires me with his hat on. So, so then he cut you off. He does inspire yeah. me. So he yeah, I would say Travis Goodspeed. He wrote a lot of articles that I read. It's like going around like uh, mm -hmm. firmware readout protection and bad stuff like that. Yeah, I I agree with both of those. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to add, I guess, uh, as already mentioned, Bunny Huang has done some really odd, like if you just look at all the stuff that he's done, it's just a bunch of awesome stuff in this space. Um, and uh, Joe Grand being another person who kind of did a lot of the stuff that made mm -hmm. hardware hacking a thing. Uh, worth looking at his stuff. Most recently, he has a GPS that will always bring you to pizza. Uh, so that's his latest project. Uh, and then more recently, actually, uh, Colin O'Flynn, Thomas Roth, and some other people who are doing, uh, well, all sorts of stuff. Fault injection is a big part of what, what they're doing. So the, as you may have seen on Twitter, the AirTag hacking uh, that's been happening. So that was an interesting collaborative effort where... Colin found like all the pinouts and stuff, and then he went to bed. And then Thomas ended up looking at all the you know, glitching the microcontroller using some known exploits to break the firmware protection on it and dumped it. And then some other people are doing the reverse engineering of that firmware. So that, I think that's been pretty, a pretty neat one to watch. Uh, if you haven't seen that yet, just go I don't know, Google through AirTag hacking, and you'll probably find some some of those threads on Twitter. There's a great video from Thomas about how he dump the firmware off of it. Yeah, and, and to see this happening almost live on Twitter, it happened so fast. I was, you know, of course this was going to happen, but but the scale and the speed and the quality of the work, which is like, fine, cool. <laughs> well, Agreed. thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other questions, but if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make on, or points about hardware or, you know, you know, get people in league and, and try hacking stuff. Uh, I open the floor to you. Yeah, I will say start with routers. It's like the one, the cheap one, they, they sell uh, like in store. Uh, they are often easy. They do have serial port. They, uh, 
sometimes they do have JTAG, they, not, they have NOR flash chip you can easily read. That's a good, easy point of entry, routers. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. You're bringing me back to like the beginnings of Ilsoftil and all of that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to sit tight. Some of you guys are going to be, or it's going to soon be CTF. So for anyone who's joining us for the CTF, be sure to hydrate and, you know, get get those, uh, those hacking calories in because you're in for a treat this year. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I hope we see you in person next year. I'm, you know, extremely excited yeah. about getting some more hardware stuff into NordSec. So, Definitely. thank you so much. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.